More than 150 local corn varieties can be found in just the southern region of Oaxaca. This extensive biodiversity is a treasure, the world's genetic reservoir of corn. Millions of Mexican farmers have maintained it for thousands of years. This corn is for the family? Yes, only for the family. We use it to make tortillas. This year is a good size, so we'll save it as seed for next year's planting. You don't buy your seeds? No. You exchange them? Yes, it's our ancient barter system. To preserve its corn's diversity, Mexico has banned genetically modified crops. However, due to the NAFTA free trade agreement it signed with the United States and Canada, Mexico cannot stop the massive importation of American corn, 40% of which is genetically modified. This industrial corn, as it's called in Mexico, is highly subsidized by the U.S. government. So on local markets, it costs half as much as traditional Mexican corn. Do you always make your tortillas with local corn? Yes. It's natural and has a better yield. Also, it's more nourishing because it comes from pure soil. That's blue corn. In the past, my ancestors only planted this kind of corn. Today, we maintain it as well. It existed before the Spanish conquest. Yes, there's another kind of conquest. What's the new conquest? It's the transgenic conquest that wants to destroy everything by making local corn disappear so that their industrial corn can dominate. If they succeed, we'll be dependent on multinationals. We'll be forced to buy the fertilizer and insecticides they sell because without them, their corn won't grow. Whereas the local corn grows very well without fertilizer or herbicide. Look at it. It's very beautiful. Ignacio Chapella's article provoked a violent reaction in Mexico. Since then, the National Ecology Institute has confirmed the contamination of Mexican corn. Roundup Ready and BT genes have been found in corn from five regions of the country. What would happen if bioengineered corn crossed with traditional land races? Dr. Alberas Buya led a study using a local flower. She inserted the same gene in several specimens and then observed their growth. We observed that two plants, strictly identical from a genetic point of view, in other words, they both have the same genome, the same chromosomes and the same transgene. The only difference is that the transgene is located in different places. And well, once they grew, these plants presented a phenotype. That is to say, flower shapes that were very different. Some have flowers that are identical to their natural counterparts, like here, four petals with four sepals. But others have abnormal flowers with abnormal hair or strange petals. In addition, some are completely monstrous. The only difference in all of these plants is the location of the transgene, which was inserted randomly. Why is that worrisome? In Mexico, once the transgenic corn seeds have been released into the environment, it's very likely that the transgenes will insert themselves into the genomes of the local Mexican varieties. It's an unavoidable phenomenon, because corn plants cross naturally by wind-blown pollen. Given that, we fear that the genetic resources of traditional corn will be uncontrollably affected.
Buenos días. Eh, lo seguimos invitando para que... Good morning. We invite you to attend a meeting about the new diseases which are infecting our corn because of transgenic contamination. Aldo heads an organization of indigenous people. For two years, he's been leading an information campaign in Oaxaca communities, where Elena Alberas' fears have already been confirmed in the fields. Yo voy a mostrarles ahora I'm going to show you some photos of some corn plants that we took in our region of Sierra Juarez. We'd like to know if you have already seen this type of plant in your community. You can see that some very strange things are going on. This plant, for example, has a branch here and another one there. Normally, a corn plant is not like that. There is always only one ear per leaf. But look here. There are three ears coming out of the same leaf. They are really monsters. We sent a plant sample to a biotech lab to see if maybe it contained genetically modified genes. Unfortunately, the test came out positive. Usually, we see these types of plants along the roadside or in people's yards. It's possible that people buy corn in the shop and they drop some kernels while walking. Some kernels germinate. This is how traditional corn became contaminated. From what you've said, if we don't manage to stop their spread in our fields, soon we'll be forced to buy our corn seed because our own won't work anymore. That's very troubling. What should we do? First of all, if you find a strange plant, you should immediately remove its stamen because that's where its pollen comes from. In any case, you must be very vigilant in monitoring your plants. Don't you think it's Monsanto's strategy, what they couldn't achieve legally, they are trying to force through contamination? Yes, we end up wondering if the contamination wasn't intentional. If the center of origin of corn becomes contaminated, the rest of the planet could follow. Contamination only benefits multinationals like Monsanto. How did Monsanto react to Ignacia Chapella's study on Mexican corn contamination? Monsanto's dirty tricks campaign against fired Berkeley professor Ignacio Chapella an article by Jonathan Matthews, who heads GM Watch, a GMO information service based in southern England. According to Jonathan Matthews, Ignacio Chapella was a victim of a campaign launched on Ag BioWorld, a pro GMO internet site. On the eve of the article's publication in Nature, a certain Mary Murphy posted an email that AgBioWorld distributed to thousands of scientists around the world. She wrote, Activists will certainly run wild with news that Mexican corn has been contaminated by genes from GM corn. The very next day, a certain Andorra Smetacek posted a second email. Activists first, scientist second. It's totally a smear campaign, and this is what happens over the first couple of days. You get Murphy and Smetacek coming in, then others come in, and they say, we have to campaign on this. We have to inundate nature. We have to go to the editor of the journal, and we have to say, this research isn't valid. Smetacek and Murphy, we'd, we'd been tracking them for some time and trying to work out who they were. In the case of Smetacek, we could look at the technical headers on the email. It says received from, and then we've got an internet protocol address. 
If we go off to a website registration site, now all we have to do is just to copy that IP address. Organization name, Monsanto Company, and based in St. Louis. Then Mary Murphy left behind um, details that um, enabled us to, to track who she was. So if, if we look, look here at the information that appeared, posted by Mary Murphy, and then we get the IP address bw6.bivwood.com. When we found that that was the original name of a PR agency called the Bivings Group, we quickly found out that on their client list was Monsanto, that this was an internet PR firm for Monsanto. That means fake scientists. Well, it does